Hello and welcome to my video on My Last Duchess. This is a brilliant poem and I hope to be able to bring that out for you. It, one of the great things about this poem is it works as a piece of drama. It's written as a monologue and uh, it begins here with That's My Last Duchess. And if we emphasise the word that's, you realise that uh, this conversation has been going on for some time. Uh, and the Duke is referring back to something he said earlier, and uh, we're suddenly catching up with him in the middle of this conversation. Uh, the word last, of course, has many interpretations here, so it's our first indication that the Duchess is dead, uh, but it's also an indication that he's probably had many more um, wives before this. Um, you know, the fact that this is the last suggests that there's been a succession of them, and that's a further hint that perhaps he's killed more than one. Uh, and then she's painted on the wall, which is our evidence for this being a fresco painting. And finally in this line, we've got the possessive my, uh, a clue that he's just seen his wife as a possession, and he'll see all his wives, all his duchesses, as possessions, not as fully rounded human beings. Then we get this kind of ironic joke where he notices that she looks as if she were alive. Um, and we can tell from this that he's probably thinking about the very moment when he had her killed. Um, in art, he has preserved her in a way which suits him uh, much more deeply than um, the pleasure he got from her when she was alive. We can also infer his anger from this word here. I call that piece a wonder now. So clearly in the past, he was very unhappy with this painting. Now he realises it's a true masterpiece because it captures her exactly as though she was alive. Um, but at the time it was made, it left him deeply unhappy. And we'll find out why, uh, because he thinks that Fra Pandolf has somehow caused his wife to be unfaithful um, with him, even though I've introduced the poem showing you how that would be almost impossible while painting a fresco. Despite his jealousy about the artist, however, he's still very keen that the listener uh, knows exactly who the artist is, because he's a famous artist. Uh, therefore, the work of art itself is not quite as important to the Duke as the name of the artist. In other words, art for him is just a commodity. It's something to show his wealth rather than his appreciation of life, beauty in life. We can see here that he focuses on the artist's hands and the enjambment here uh, really forces us to think about this before we find out what the hands were doing. And I think that's important because in the Duke's mind, he's thinking about these hands being placed upon the flesh of his wife. Um, then we get to this uh, correction. She's actu he's actually worked busily a day. And so in these words, the Duke reveals to us that he must know the artist had no time to have any kind of sexual relationship with his wife. But despite knowing that, his suspicion is still there because his mind is unbalanced by jealousy. And I think Browning is suggesting that that unbalancing isn't just because he's a jealous man. It's one of the consequences of him having so much wealth and so much power. Uh, that corruption has affected even the way he thinks so that he can no longer act rationally. Now we find out of the you of the poem, the person the Duke is speaking to, we're going to find out that this is the representative of a Count. Um, the Count has a daughter, and uh, he wants this daughter to marry the Duke because of his status and position. Um, and the Duke is very keen to have a new Duchess, providing she pleases him much more than the last. We'll find out what his... Uh, requirements are. But here, he won't let this Count's representative near the painting. Consequently, he makes the man sit. 
but he allows the man to look at her. Uh, this is ironic because it's the looking at her by men that drove him to such jealousy while she was alive. Now he feels very slightly less jealous um, because he can allow people to look at her, but only if he can still keep them at a distance. Once again, we see him drop the name of Fra Pandolf. This isn't a real artist. The Browning has invented him, but he's done so in order to show um, how vain this duke is. He, even though he was jealous of this artist, he's still overcome with the fact that he's got such an apparently famous artist uh, to paint this picture just for him. The Duke then begins to paint a portrait in words for us, the uh, reading audience, to see what this wife was like. Um, she is a deep person and her depth is in her passion. So she feels life completely. And that's what art should make people do. It should make people passionate and heighten their positive emotions. But for the Duke, it's done the opposite. It's merely heightened his jealousy, not his passion for life. Um, she's earnest and serious in this picture, but as we'll see later, he chooses to see her as frivolous and irrelevant. In other words... When he describes what we can see, we see a wife that he doesn't recognise. He sees her as something completely different. His view is an entirely sexist one. He only ever sees her as a possession. Um, we, however, through his words, can see, him, see her as a deep and passionate human being. And this is partly what makes it a feminist poem, because... This um, depth of her womanhood is denied in the society that the Duke rules. And that's a parallel, perhaps, of the society that uh, Browning is writing in. He's saying that women are not appreciated for themselves. Then Browning uses this clever allusion here. Curtains are drawn, in other words, opened. But, of course, to draw is also... Um, the beginnings of artistic technique. And uh, the Duke here is stalled at this stage. He can only draw, and actually he's only drawing curtains. And this is contrasted with the immense skill that's gone into the painting of the fresco. Um, so this man who thinks he appreciates art so much is actually uh, laughably lacking in skill. Uh, and that's a parallel to how he's also lacking in any artistic um, feeling, any artistic judgment. Um, he only values art by the uh, reputation of its creator, so if it's done by a famous person, uh, and he only values it because it's cost a lot of money, and it's his money, and therefore a symbol of how rich and powerful he is. Here, the um, Count's representative has obviously asked him something, about the wife's expression in this painting, uh, seeming so lifelike. And uh, he says, well, yes, other people have looked at this as though they wanted to ask me if they dared. This is the past tense here, durst. Um, we focus here, like the Duke does, on his power. Uh, so he's reminding the Count of how powerful he is. Um, so, not the first... He's going to say, you're not the first person to look here. In other words, this is a bargaining tool. He's telling the Count's representative that he's had other offers from rich fathers who want to marry off their daughters, but obviously he's not accepted um, their offer. And we'll find out later that's because what he wants is money. He wants a massive dowry in order to marry the daughter of whichever father wants to make an alliance with the Duke. So marriage here has nothing to do with love. It's all to do with his wealth and his power. This is another way that Browning tries to show that the society is corrupt. His jealousy is again revealed when he talks about um, the expression on his wife's face 
that wasn't caused by her husband's presence only. In other words, he stood there while his wife's being painted, so jealous as he being about leaving her alone with another man, and despite the fact that he was there, there's still this implication that he was jealous of the attention that the artist gave his wife, even though that was his job. And we can see that here by more enjambment here. So he's calling a blush, if you like, on the, um, on the wife's face, that spot. And a Victorian reader would have associated the spot as a mark of um, guilt or shame. Uh, but, and the enjambment asks us to consider her guilt or shame until we find out, no, it was a spot of joy. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, this was a mark of how much she loved life. Um, she actually seems to appreciate life fully. And that, we realise, is one of the reasons the Duke has had her killed. He is, if you like, anti-life, anti-joy. And that again shows the corruption of um, the ruling classes. They're sucking the joy out of the life of those beneath them. This would be Browning's political point if we read the poem politically. And again, this point is made through the extreme vanity of the Duke, as once more for the third time he mentions Fra Pandolf's name. The next description of his wife operates on a huge number of levels. So, to start with, he imagines or remembers the words that the artist must have used, used that caused his wife to blush. Paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat, the artist might have said, um, commenting on how she reacted to a previous compliment, this one here. Now, what's going on there is the Duke's jealousy is apparent just in the words that he imagines the painter has said. So the half flush um, describes his wife as being sexually awakened here. Um, that's probably not what happened at all, but because he's obsessed with his wife having sex with other men, he can't help seeing that in the portrait. Um, then, in red here, we've got a clue as to how he's had her killed. The language is deliberately violent. And so instead of the word fading here, so imagining the blush fading along her throat, he's used the word dies, a strong clue that in his own mind he's remembering her death and how he had her killed. So along her throat leads us to two possible interpretations. Uh, one, he's had her strangled, or two, her throat has been cut. And Browning gives us both these images in a contrast. So this in yellow is the very thing that makes her appear so lifelike in the portrait, and it's her lifelike appearance that is the very thing that reminds the Duke of having her killed. Uh, and so there's a clue here that it's not actually just sexual jealousy that's got him to have her killed. It's actually that she is his opposite. She absolutely loves life. This was a spot of joy, remember. And joy seems to be something the Duke is incapable of feeling. And Browning is perhaps suggesting that the Duke is less human than the rest of us because he has been corrupted by power. Browning develops this idea in the next four lines. Again, he repeats the idea of the spot of joy. And in yellow, I've highlighted all the positive things about his wife here. Uh, she's got a heart. In other words, she's kind-natured. She's full of feeling. She's glad. She's impressed by life. Uh, she likes whatever she looks on. In other words, like an artist, she is drinking in what the world shows her. An artist then reproduces that on canvas or on the wall, but it's uh, this ability to enjoy the senses and fully appreciate life that marks her out as different from him. And we can see the difference in the red. How shall I say? He's 
struggling to find words to explain his wife's feelings because Browning is trying to show us he's incapable of feeling the same way and he puts limits on everything. Uh, so she's too soon made glad. She's too easily impressed. So the Duke is all about negativity. He's about the absence of being positive, uh, the absence of fully embracing life. And that, again, is an image of how power has corrupted him and made him less and not more of a human being. And then here we can see that he's fixated on jealousy again. Her looks went everywhere. Um, as someone who appreciates the world, she's drinking everything in. But to him, it's just looking at other men and fantasising, perhaps, about how they might be better, um, better lovers, better husbands than the Duke she's with. Now, as we listen to him, Browning makes clear that the Duke's um, fears that his wife is being unfaithful uh, with other men, not just the artist, are also ridiculous. Um, and he's using this jealousy to mask something that's even worse in him, and that's the corruption of his nature, the corruption of power. Let me explain. So here... He says, sir, it was all one. So everything was treated as the same in his, eyes, his wife's eyes. And this really annoys him. He wants to be the most important thing. And uh, he's outraged, not that actually she was talking to other men um, or flirting with them or enjoying life. What's outraged him is that she should see him as the most important thing in her world, uh, because that's the way he sees himself. But she doesn't. Because she loves life, she finds the good in everything. Here we have the image of um, the, the dropping of the daylight in the West. The sunset delighted her, but he's incapable of taking that delight. To himself, he's greater than any sunset he hates the fact that she's been given a bough of cherries, uh, not because it's come from another man so much, but that because it's a picture of her innocence and enjoyment of life. And he can't understand how she can enjoy life more than she enjoys being married to him. He hates the fact that it's all one. Uh, she looks upon him as another good part of life. Uh, and how ironic is that? Because, of course, he's not a good part of her life, and yet she still seems to have given him the benefit of the doubt. Um, he was uh, something special in life, just like all these other things. Um, he's also disgusted at the white mule that she used to ride about on. Again, a childish and innocent pleasure, suggesting that there's no malice in her at all. She's just someone who's in love with life. Some readers think that uh, this is proof that she is flirting with other men, but the Duke's own word here to describe the man who's brought um, the cherries to her as officious, uh, a kind of fussy person following um, orders, if you like, gives the lie to that. He's obviously not someone behaving in a flirtatious way or you know, giving her something in secret he's doing it quite openly um, because it's a simple innocent gesture it's not something that needs to be hidden away okay it's probably time to talk to you a bit about the structure of this monologue so each line is 10 syllables long um, it's crafted now browning is doing this for at least two reasons one is to show how um, skilled he is as a poet. Uh, a monologue delivered in perfect uh, pentameter lines of ten syllables. But it's also to show how contrived and mannered the Duke is. This is a speech that he's probably prepared in order to get more money out of the Count's representative and also in order to warn the Count 
that he has to have a word with his daughter to make sure his daughter doesn't displease the Duke, because if she does, she's likely to end up dead, like the last Duchess. Um, but this syllable pattern breaks down uh, on these two lines here. Uh, but thanked as if she ranked. Um, this, if you like, is the psychological break in the poem when we find out most what's wrong with the Duke. So let's look at the lines more closely and find out why he hasn't been able to order them, why they've still got uh, 11 syllables instead of 10. He's talking about her blush, and then he picks on her good manners. She's thanked men, and he has to acknowledge that that's good. He'd expect her to behave like that, but he's not happy with it. Uh, so there's an objection. But thanked, but now the enjambment, we're expecting a proper reason why he's not happy, but he's lost for words. Somehow, I know not how. And this is the moment that Browning shows us that the Duke doesn't even know why he's behaving in the way he does. He's so out of touch with life that he cannot even understand his own impulses. Now, Browning is prepared to reveal what his impulses are. And they're all about status and power. And through that, Browning is suggesting that status and power have corrupted the Duke and if we extrapolate that to a wider society, he's saying that that sort of power and rank and privilege will corrupt anyone who is part of that system. So we can look on this as a complete attack against the aristocracy, the whole idea of having a noble class. Now Browning reveals the Duke's hypocrisy. What he values most is his own 900 years old name. So this isn't just himself, it's the power handed down through generation after generation, as presumably each generation has become richer and more powerful. That's the most important thing in his world. He's unable to appreciate the wider world, nature, um, life itself, that his wife is able to enjoy and that Browning thinks we all enjoy through art. Next, he says, well, he asks, who would stoop, so low he means, as to blame his wife? Well, of course he does, uh, but he's claiming that he doesn't. Uh, this is where his hypocrisy is revealed. He's claiming that he wouldn't actually blame her, but this whole poem so far has been about finding the negatives in his wife and blaming her. Next, he suggests that uh, he doesn't have skill in speech, but this, of course, is contradicted by the speech itself, where we've seen the uh, pentameter running through um, every single line, except where he's been lost for words. The next four lines return us again to a feminist interpretation of the poem. Uh, Browning here subtly complains about the way a man views a woman. Um, and again, he's suggesting, I think, that that's part of um, the aristocracy, the way they view uh, women in society. So the first thing we notice is that the Duke never names his wife. She's just here and won, um, as though she's not even a real person in his mind. The emotion that he used to describe, uses to describe her first here is, look, disgust. He's actually disgusted in her. Uh, we've seen nothing disgusting in her. We've seen only the positive. And so Browning is asking us to see that um, he chooses the very best in his wife, all those things that we would value um, in another human being, and is disgusted by those things. Uh, this is a symbol of how uh, women are oppressed here, not allowed to be their true selves, uh, by the men they marry. And we see another way that women have their power removed. Not only are they not named, um, not only are they defined by their husband, she's his duchess, not a person in her own light, right, here 
He wants her to let herself be lessened so, to be taught, he means here. And we can see again that this is another reason he's had her killed. She isn't open to him telling her um, not just what to do, but how to think. Uh, she wants some independence from him and it, as a human being. But because she's female and also his possession, uh, he won't let that happen. Many readers just see this as a criticism of the Duke, the character in this poem. However, I think there's um, an opportunity to see this as social criticism. And uh, Browning is suggesting that in Victorian society, women are still not seen entirely as individuals. Um, and if you look into the history of Victorian society, you'll see how relevant an issue that was. Uh, so you've got um, female authors, for example, um, disguising their names and publishing themselves with male names simply so they can get published. Browning continues this theme of uh, female equality by having the Duke talk about her matching her wits to yours, in other words, to himself. She sees her own wits as equal to his, despite the fact that he's a man, and despite the fact that he's a Duke. Uh, his sexism is revealed here. I choose never to stoop. And that image shows how superior he feels to his wife, because to talk to her would be to stoop down low. Um, and he refuses um, to allow her to see, her, um, see herself as in any way equal to him. And Browning is asking um, his readers, look, is our society um, in uh, the 1840s or whatever, is our society really any different? Are women truly um, individual people who are treated as equals, or are they still seen as vastly inferior? Now the Duke reminds the Count's representative of his power. I gave commands, he says. And this is the moment when we find out he's ordered his wife to be killed, so disgusted with her, and so inferior does he think she is, he hasn't even killed her himself as a crime of passion. He's simply done it in a calculated way and had an assassin or assassins do it for him. Uh, you can read this, or we can read this, as the idea that there's more than one smile he's had stopped, um, suggesting that he's had a lover killed with her or at least a man killed with her. But a more interesting reading, I think, is the idea that it was the smiles it themselves which caused him to kill her. In other words, it's her joy in life, not the fact that she's flirting with any man, that has caused him to kill her. Because he's the opposite. He has no joy in life. He doesn't experience joy at all. Now... He points out again that she looks alive. Uh, this is now more of a threat to the Count's representative because he's reminding the Count's representative exactly what will happen to his next Duchess if she doesn't behave in a way that he likes. Notice also that as he's getting close to closing the deal on the marriage that his sentences become much shorter. He's much more businesslike. And this is an extraordinary um, contrast to the fact that he's just confessed to murder here. And again, Browning is showing the corruption of the society the Duke is at the head of. Um, he believes that uh, the law has no power over him. So he can actually near enough confess that he's had his wife killed and expect to get away with this because he is above the law. And Browning is pointing out that this is a problem with power. Uh, when people become too powerful, they automatically become too corrupt. They become um, untouchable and can operate um, even as murderers without being punished. 
Now Browning launches into a fuller attack on the sexism of this society. So what appeals to the Duke is the money, the munificence, generosity with money that he can see in the Count because it's the money that the Duke's interested in. Uh, the money that is attached to a marriage is called a dowry and there's a whole social system here geared up to making men pay each other for um, taking one possession, uh, a woman, off their hands. In other words, a daughter is an expense. She's not an asset to a family. She's a liability. And so you pay another man to take her off your hands. An extraordinary idea that shows us how a woman is seen as worth much, much less than a man. Here we can see how um, women are seen as possessions. So she is the possession of his, the Count, um, and the daughter possesses a self. Um, this is the self that the Duke is interested in. He's interested in a, a self that fully respects him. Not a person, but an image. A self here is an image of a person not the daughter's um, true personality. Because if she reveals her true personality, like with Last Duchess, she'll be killed. Again, he is not interested in her as a human being, but simply as a work of art. She is fair, so she's attractive, and that's all that he demands, apart from complete obedience. Browning draws out this uh, feminist perspective with the Duke's words here. So the daughter's fair self is my object. Literally, he is objectifying a woman, turning her into a thing, something he can control and something he can possess. Exactly the behaviour that um, feminist criticism accuses men of and Browning, I think, is being quite explicit about this. Uh, he's saying that's what's wrong with male behaviour, not just this, um, this duke, but that's what's wrong with the whole idea of having an aristocracy. Because in order to keep their power, they have to marry into each other's families. And in order to do that, they can't just rely on their sons and daughters marrying for love. They have to marry for power and wealth. Next we can see how obsessed he is with power when he asks the Count's representative to notice the sta statue of Neptune, the god of the sea. And this is a metaphor or symbol, if you like, for how he sees himself. And then the seahorse that uh, Neptune is taming is obviously a symbol of his last wife, the Duchess, but also to the Count's representative, a symbol of the Count's daughter. Um, that's what I want, is what he seems to be suggesting. I want somebody that I can tame, uh, somebody that I will see as less than human. Symbolically, she is like a seahorse. And then, as an artist, uh, Browning is seeing the seahorse as representative of nature. And art... Um, doesn't seek to dominate nature like that. It seeks to represent nature. Neptune, however, is controlling it uh, again in a corrupt way for his own interests. So this is another attack on um, the Duke's lack of appreciation for art and, by extension, the ruling classes who are buying up art and putting them in private collections. And if you go to... Um, any uh, National Hunt, national Trust property, you'll see what I mean, masterpieces squirrelled away just to be viewed by the rich, but not public art to be enjoyed by everyone. Um, whereas a poem works in the opposite way. Anyone can afford the price of the book, uh, as long as they can read, and anyone can enjoy that level of art. And perhaps um, Browning is suggesting why Poetry here is a higher calling because it's an art form that can't be so easily corrupted. It's available to everyone. Everyone can appreciate nature through the poet's words. 
Uh, so the poet genuinely makes the world a better place because his art or her art is available to everyone. The value of the poet's art is in its craftsmanship then, not its rarity because you can't find it. Here, the statue is rare and that's what gives it value, not because the skill is rare in making it, but because there aren't many of them around. Once again, the Duke drops the name of the artist Klaus of Innsbruck, again an invented artist, but to show um, his own vanity again. The art itself um, has no value to him. The value comes from what it represents about him, how powerful he is, what it represents about his uh, wealth, he can afford something so rare, what it represents about his power, he can afford uh, famous artist's work, and it's cast in bronze. He sees himself as permanent, uh, like a bronze statue. Um, it will last forever. And ultimately, he is completely obsessed with himself, which is why Browning has him end the poem with that last word, me, and an exclamation mark to emphasise his own vanity. Well done if you've stuck through to the end of this video. Here's my summary of the three kinds of attack that Browning is making in the poem. We can clearly see that he's attacked the aristocracy uh, for their corruption, uh, for a feeling that they're all-powerful, um, being able to live outside the law. Similarly, he's attacking men um, for their objectification of women, treating women as extensions of themselves, but worse, treating them as objects and possessions. And then finally, it's attack on the private collector of art. Um, he believes, it seems through this poem, that art should be available to all. It should be for the benefit of everyone because it celebrates life. And the Duke is the antithesis of that. He does the opposite of celebrating life. He tries to capture a moment of it in art and prefers that to the real thing. In fact, he has the real thing, the Duchess, killed. And then the worst uh, crime in this society uh, seems to me the uh, response to the poem because the Count is likely to go away, listen to the story of um, what the Duke has done to his previous Duchess and still agree to marry his daughter to the Duke. Certainly the Duke expects that and the fact that this is only the last Duchess, presumably in a line of Duchesses, suggests that his expectation is right. There will be another rich, noble man who will marry his daughter off as an object and possession to this vicious, uh, almost emotionless criminal. If you liked this kind of uh, in-depth analysis, please subscribe to my channel uh, for more videos. Good luck!